moment All you wandering hearts If you're looking for us There's a well to see your thirst Come close and be still If you're feeling far off Like you're too far gone There's a man who gave himself So you would know After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A, far, a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on the hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I the mountains at our face, strong than the power of the grave. Come 
sin in the trials and the change This one thing remains This one thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails It never gives out Never runs out on me Your love never fails It never gives out Never runs out on me It's your love It's your love Sing on and on Confident, I'm covered by the power of your great love. And my death is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart. Of wrong, 
My sin washed away in your blood Too much to make sense of it all I know that your love breaks my fall A scandal of grace You died in my place So my soul After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds of weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen clothes with the spices as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, 
since the tomb was close at hand, they lay Jesus there. Good evening and good Friday. You may take your seats. If you are a guest here with us this evening, we are so glad that you're here worshiping with us. On behalf of Christ Church, I'm lead pastor Jesse Jarvis, and I just want to welcome everyone. I know there's a number of folks who let us know they're coming from other area churches. Maybe your church doesn't have a Good Friday service. We're just honored that you're here with us, especially if you've never been here before. We just want you to feel right at home. We're going to end our time together this evening celebrating the Lord's Supper and taking the sacrament of communion together. You don't have to be a member of Christ Church to participate Um, But we do ask that this uh, sacrament be sanctified for those who have faith in Christ Jesus, who join with Jesus, receive the eternal life that is a gift from God. That's what this stands for. That's what this substance is. This is what our faith rests in, the covenant that God has made with us. And so if you haven't made that covenant with God, uh, we hope tonight's the night for you uh, to say yes to all the amazing things that he has done for you. But if, if you have not made that covenant, we just ask that you watch and listen and find out what this is, is all about. Um, I don't know if you've been to a Good Friday service before. Um, sometimes they can be a little on the melancholy side. And for obvious reasons, uh, we're talking about the death of Jesus leading up to the miraculous uh, resurrection of Jesus on Sunday morning. And so it can kind of have a bit of a funeral feel to it. Anybody ever notice that? There's also a lot of darkness and negativity that we could focus in on, the, the depravity of humankind, the fallenness of our world, the great enemy against God, the devil, uh, all that is held in the balance and the betrayal and execution of the Son of God. Jesus wept as he came into Jerusalem because of uh, the, the darkness that was going to take place at his death and the ensuing judgment of God because of that. And so When we focus on those dark elements, uh, it can definitely bring us into a dark tone. But because of the reality of what Good Friday really means for us, it doesn't necessarily have to stay there. And I want to lift our eyes beyond the darkness and the sacrifice and the death and, and all that it entails to the reality of what Good Friday has achieved for us, the gracious gift of God. It's funny, I want to tell you a story. As a pastor, I do a lot of funerals, and I I can't say I enjoy funerals, obviously, for obvious reasons, Um, but I I do take every opportunity that I can to officiate at a funeral when I'm asked. And the reason for that is it brings people to the reality of life and death and the seriousness of being right with God. And so whenever someone invites me to preside over a group of people grieving and also experiencing the reality of death, and I have the opportunity to tell them about the gift of God, which is eternal life, I'm going to take it. Uh, and because I do funerals, oftentimes I have, especially elderly people, they'll reach out to me. At some point, they become aware of their mortality or they've been diagnosed with something, and they want to have this conversation with me where they tell me what they want their funeral to be like. Now, probably none of you have experienced that, um, and uh, sometimes that can be uh, obviously uh, a little dark. But um, at one such evening, I went to the home of a woman who was a part of our church for years. Her name was Bunny. Actually, that was not her real name, but everybody called her Bunny. And Bunny said to me, I don't want my funeral to be sad. I don't want anybody crying. I want everybody wearing Hawaiian shirts. I want everyone to get a lay at the door. I want a roast pig in the back. I want the Beach Boys and Elvis. So she was like committed to her funeral and memorial service being this lively event where everybody was celebrating. And so I'm sitting there, you know, respectfully taking notes of all of her wishes. And um, at the end of our conversation, she said, so is that doable? Can you make that happen for me? And I had to say, well, Bunny, uh... As a pastor, and having done a lot of funerals, I can tell you, the people who show up are going to drive the feel of your funeral more than your plans, Uh, because you won't be there (laughs) to influence uh, the evening. And so I'll do the best I can with your lists, and I'd suggest you uh, get some other people uh, involved, but uh, when, when that moment comes, there's no telling how the people who are there are going to feel, and that's going to affect Uh, the mood of the funeral. Now, no surprise to you, it is actually very lively, and there's a lot of people laughing and celebrating. A lot of tears shed, obviously, um, but you can imagine a woman like that and the impact that she had on those who knew and loved her. 
Well, the same can be true for the funeral of or the death of Jesus on Good Friday. A lot of times we bring our own sense of what he means to us, meant to us, how we feel, our maybe guilt or shame or anxiety or misunderstanding. And what I'd like to do is draw your attention to the meaning that God gives to us in the scriptures. And not just, not just the facts. We read, we heard from the gospels from John 19, the facts of what happened, the, the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the meaning and why we can lift our eyes from the darkness of Good Friday as we take the Lord's Supper together, remembering and proclaiming his death, as morbid as those words sound, as an amazingly powerful and joy-filled event. And the reason for that is as follows, that Good Friday is actually the death of death and the beginning of new life. You see, a, a person had to die because death is the wages of sin and sin is in the world. And because of the great and powerful love of God, he sent his son Jesus to be fully God and fully man so that in him he might represent all of mankind and die a death that was sufficient to cover the debt of every human being. And yet in his being, he was powerful to overcome death and the grave itself, which means when he went into the grave, what died with him was our sin and our death and the death of death itself. But because of who he is and what he did, death was unable to keep him, and he emerged, leaving death itself in the grave, which transformed our future death and our hold on life. And that, brothers and sisters, is good news. If there's ever a funeral you should be cheering at, it should be the funeral of death, amen. And so when death died, God's people are happy. But it's not just the death of death, as if that wasn't enough. Good Friday means the beginning of new life. Thank you, Ron. It's the beginning of new life. Uh, it's not the fullness of new life. All of us are aware from our week that we are not experiencing the fullness of new life. Can I get an amen? We are all walking through the difficulties of life in a fallen world and seeking to navigate following God and loving other people with all the difficulties that go along with that. And yet, we possess in seed form what is certainly going to be sown into the ground in our physical death, but raised to an immortal, imperishable, powerful, and glorified, eternal, bodily life. And that's the hope we live with. Amen? And his death was the beginning of new life. Isaiah 25, 8 to 9, prophetically speaking about the ministry and the death of Jesus, says... He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Do you see the joy that comes from the death of death? And the purpose of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we read in John 10, juxtaposed to the ministry of the evil one that only seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Brothers and sisters, I want nothing more for myself, for my family, for you to grow in your experience of the life that God gives, that it starts as something small, but it becomes exceedingly and abundantly greater than anything you could ask or imagine. And that is the gift of Good Friday. The Apostle Paul takes this reality to the church in Corinth in his second letter, which is what I'd love to talk to you about for just a few minutes before we take the Lord's Supper together. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle's talking about the amazing transformation that comes because of the death of Jesus and because of our union with him through faith. And this is what he says, that this new life begins with making you a new person. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone, and can I stop right there? 
Because every once in a while I run into someone that thinks for whatever reason they are outside the qualifications of good things from God. These are the people that think when I go to church, the building's going to fall down on everyone or catch fire or get struck by lightning. Some natural calamity is going to occur when they enter or darken the doors of a church. Now, obviously, they don't think that. It's a, it's a way of saying, a way of expressing their inward sense of self-worth or the lack thereof. When the scriptures say anyone, they mean anyone. 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 Now, the contingency is, do you know Jesus or not? If anyone is in Christ, he is or she is a new creation. A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. One of the things I love is to hear people share their testimony, their story of when they met Jesus and their life was transformed forever. I love hearing the trajectory that people had been on, the things they had done, the place they had found themselves, and then this intersection they had with God with the good news about Jesus, his life and death and resurrection came into their ears and into their hearts, and faith was found, and they put their trust and became one of those in Christ, and then they talk about the immediate things that begin to change. It's not necessarily that in that moment, the day before their conversion and the day after their conversion, on the outside they looked very much differently, but the trajectory of their life changed drastically in that moment. And when they go back and tell those stories, sometimes we go, what? You did what? You see an old picture, you used to look like what? Right? And this is how drastic this reality gets played out over time. You are a new person. If you're in Christ tonight, you are a new person. If you are going to take the cup and the bread and celebrate your union with Christ and the new covenant that God has made with his blood for your benefit, then you are in Christ and you are a new person. Not what you used to be, not what you will be, but new. Can I get amen? amen. Secondly, you have a new purpose. It's not enough that you just are different on the inside God leaves you here on this planet to engage in what he is doing. Verse 18 says, all this is from God. You see who's at work here? It came to us as a gift, sovereignly by God's hand, and we receive it. All this is from God who, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You are not only a new creation, but now you're a minister. I want to just give you all credentials. Here you go. Minister, minister, minister. You don't have to do weddings and funerals, but listen, you have a job to do. If you have a story of the miraculous transformation and salvation that God has gifted to you through his son Jesus, because of the events of Good Friday through to Easter Sunday morning, then you are God's agent, his messenger, his envoy, his apostle, to a world that is not new and is old and is in need of the transformation that we have received. You have a new purpose. In verse 19 it says, that is in Christ God was reconciling the world, there's another one of those big words that encompasses everyone, the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God is very much alive and at work in our world and wants to bring good news to dead hearts, wants to bring those who are in the kingdom of darkness miraculously into the kingdom of light. And the way that happens is when the truth and reality of the gospel, what God has done for humankind in the life, death, resurrection of his son Jesus, reaches ears and hearts. That's where the transformation takes place. And that can happen on Sunday mornings or Friday evenings. That can happen when God's people are gathered and the word is being preached. Obviously, yes. But that can also happen across the table in your kitchen. That can happen next to the bed uh, with your children in the evening as you tuck them in. That can happen uh, at work, uh, in, the, in the carpool. It can happen everywhere if you are willing to recognize that part of being a new creation is living with a new purpose. And that is to be an agent of God's message of, re of reconciliation. This is, why, this is why I'm just passionate about not just inviting everybody to church 
on Easter. Not that we shouldn't capitalize on that opportunity, but empowering and pushing and inspiring and compelling every follower of Jesus to bring that good news to the people that they interact with. Lastly, God has not only changed you personally and given you a new purpose, but part of that beginning of new life that we are that we are celebrating the death of death and that we are cultivating that new life that God has given us in seed form and allowing it to fulfill our lives is that God is putting together a new people. In verse 20 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, Therefore, here's the result, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. And here's the appeal. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. What other parts of your life do you use the word implore? That's a strong word, isn't it? I mean, that's a that's a that's a strong. It's stronger than urge. Certainly stronger than suggest. It has a force to it, but an inability to make someone do something. When do you implore someone to do something? Maybe your kids with their chores. Please make your bed. Please, it's not going to make it itself. Please put your plate in the sink, right? I'm imploring you. You ever have to implore your kids to open their Christmas presents? You see, the only thing that requires being implored is for someone that doesn't know the value of the thing that you are bringing to them. And part of that is, is, uh, is not just, here's this good news, take it, but God's putting a new people together, and you're a part of it. It's part of the reason we take this supper together. Uh, I, know, I know there's people that practice this differently and put little booths around that corners of the room, and you can kind of go take communion by yourself. But brothers and sisters, this is a communal event. You're coming to the table of God's family, and we are all here as new persons with new purpose and part of the new people. And so you are just as much as part of me as I am a part of you because we are a part of him. And God is sending us to implore the world, not only to get right with God, but to come into his family. Isn't that amazing? And that's the kind of people we want to be. That's the kind of environment we want to create. That's the, kind of, that's the reason for space. That's the reason we make more space for more people is that God wants more and more and more. It's like those crazy families with nine children. When are you going to stop? I just want more, right? That's God. He's got the biggest family, and he's never done. He always wants more. And the, the basic facts of this, this message to be implored to others is this, for our sake, For your sake, it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, for your sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin. And that phenomenal substitution, that transaction took place, mysterious as it is, impossible maybe for us to get our heads around Jesus becoming what he was not, so that we might become what we are not, and then turned into what he truly is so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a people to be a part of. And this is why uh, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper tonight on on Good Friday. I've heard people say that you can tell a lot about a person by how many people come to their funeral. That's not true at all. There's very little you can tell. I've done some funerals of some very old people, and they just outlived everyone else. There's just nobody left to go to their funeral, right? And so you can't tell anything. Um, But you can tell something about the quality of a person's life based on uh, how people speak and how they're impacted when they do get to the funeral. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we have the opportunity to do something that nobody else does. You don't get to go to your own funeral, Uh, but Jesus does. And by his spirit, when we gather in his name and and we celebrate the death of death and the beginning of new life and the things that it means for us that we're a new person with a new purpose and part of the new people, he gets to sit right here. And here's what he's doing. He is smiling at your face and your presence. He is glad that you are here. He was glad to take your sins away from you, to to redeem you from them, to forgive you for them, to repurpose your life. He's, he's smiling, and it was for the joy set before him. 
that he endured the cross, despising its shame, and now is seated at the right hand of God. This was the heart he had towards his disciples when on the eve of his betrayal and death and execution, he, in Luke twenty-two nineteen, 19, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. And so tonight we are gonna, we're going to celebrate the gift of God, the death of death, and the beginning of new life. Would the ushers come forward? The guys and ladies are going to uh, pass out the communion elements to each section. If you want to just take hold of those and keep them in your hand until everybody is served, and then I'll lead us in taking those together. And uh, instead of me talking over the process of uh, people trying to get the elements, which sometimes I do, I'd love for us to just have a few moments of silence. And so um, don't worry about when it's your turn, when it comes to you, just get what you need, hold on to it, help uh, the people around you or whoever, uh, your children, whoever's with you. But um, we're just going to just be quiet for a moment, and then I'll come back up and lead us, and then we'll close. One of the most fascinating conversion stories in the Bible is that of the thief or the criminal that was converted, who was crucified next to Jesus. In one of the gospel accounts, both of those criminals are railing at Jesus and ribbing him about who he says he is and, hey, save us all if you're at, while you're at it, and mocking him, both of them. And at some point during the hours of these three being crucified together, without much out of Jesus' mouth, he said seven small things from the cross. Something about who this man was came alive in the heart of one of those two criminals. And without the ability to ever live with new purpose or experience the fellowship of being part of God's new people, his life changed forever and he became a new person. Without being able to be baptized, without taking this supper ever, couldn't reach his mouth. <laughs> Something happened. And what happened was he knew Jesus to be different than he thought of him before. And some words between those two transpired. Remember me. Acknowledging who Jesus was and what he was capable of. And immediately, Jesus responds, today you will be with me in paradise. And those words, with me, are powerful words. Listen, especially if you're here tonight, you're not taking the supper, you're watching on live, on Facebook, if you don't know God and you don't know what do I do next, there's only one thing needful, and that is for you to respond to the God that wants to know you. He's done everything possible and necessary so that you might say, what about me, remember me? And he says, absolutely, that's all it takes, is you saying, I'm with him, take care of me, and he will say yes. And that's what we're celebrating when we take this, this meal. This is a covenant. This is God fulfilling both sides of a covenant. We're not good at making promises and keeping them, are we? We've missed car payments, uh, been unfaithful in our marriages to some degree. We haven't done everything we said we were going to do. But here's the thing. God saw your inability to be what he required, and so he became what he required of you. He fulfilled both sides of that covenant and he gives that to you in the death of his son Jesus. And so we do the non-work of receiving it by faith, amen? And so God, we thank you for the gift of yourself, of designing a way for us to know you and be transformed by you. God, I thank you that no one is outside of the realm of your reach or your desire to love and save.